And it is my honor to welcome all of you to the first Michel Serre Distinguished Lecture. This is our most important yearly event and celebration, recently renamed in honor of our colleague Michel Serre, who passed away in 2019 after teaching at Stanford, among other places, for more than 30 years. We are extremely excited and honored to have our distinguished colleague, Jean-Pierre Dupuis, inaugurate this series in honor of Michel, who was his colleague and friend for so long. We are also very happy to welcome you today. A few announcements before we begin. This is a webinar, so speakers only will be visible on your screen and talking, and you are currently on mute. You will be able to ask questions via Zoom's Q&A feature, which you can access by uh, moving your mouse at the bottom of your screen. And it should be a little window that says Q&A. And you can type in your questions anytime. Actually, you can type them in during the lecture. And we will address those questions to Jean-Pierre at the end of his lecture. Sometimes we'll summarize them if needed. Uh, but we will do our best to address all your questions as best we can in the time available. So please be patient with us. Thank you. Um, to introduce Professor Dupuis, I will pass it on to my colleague, Professor of French and Chair of the Division of Literatures, Cultures and Languages at Stanford, Cécile Aldui. Thank you, Laura, and uh, welcome to everyone. It is my most sincere pleasure to welcome and introduce our colleague, Jean-Pierre Dupuis, who is also to many here a friend. He has been to me a mentor and a role model. Jean-Pierre is one of these most rare of beings, a true humanist thinker. The more than 40 books that he has published and have been translated in a dozen languages attest to his insatiable pursuit of a life of thinking, of philosophical unrest, and rightful ethical concerns. This tireless mind never ceases to confront the great questions of all times the value of life, desire and jealousy, worth and value, and the most urgent questions of our times. How to think a world that can self-destroy in minutes and a thousand times over with its nuclear capacities. How to think our inability to embrace correctly climate change and act accordingly. An engineer by training who graduated from Polytechnique, where he is now Professor Emeritus, and the Ecole des Mines and the Ecole Normale Supérieure, he has built an impressive body of work that is in constant dialogues with a lineage of thinkers, among whom Ivan Illich, René Girard, Jean-Marie Domenac, and Michel Serre. The DLCL community is extremely proud and humbled to recognize in Jean-Pierre the true successor of the great philosophers and thinkers who have established the reputation of the French and Italian department at Stanford as a haven for rare minds who think man and the world with a breadth and depth that transcends our narrow academic disciplines to reach back to the origins of philosophy as a pure principle of rational curiosity. Jean-Pierre has not walked in the footsteps of René Girard and Michel Serre, who we honor today. No, he has traced his own path parallel and in conversation with that of his mentors and peers. A specialist of the origins of cognitive science, of political philosophy, the problem of evil, Jean-Pierre's most influential groundbreaking work truly, which has been sadly prescient, is his theorization of humanity's temporal, cognitive and moral failure to approach catastrophes, be they self-inflicted or caused by natural disasters. In that capacity, he has been an advisor to Jared Brown, governor of California, proving once more that humanities matter. Among his many books, one can cite For an Enlightened Catastrophism, When the Impossible is Certain, Short Metaphysics of Tsunamis, Return from Chernobyl, The Mark of the Sacred. In his last book published this year, La catastrophe ou la vie, the catastrophe or life, thoughts in times of a pandemic, he forces us to think straight about the value of life and economic worth. I want to thank Jean-Pierre for joining us today in inaugurating the Michel Serre Distinguished Lecture. Jean-Pierre, je te donne la parole. Thank you.
Oh, yeah. Merci beaucoup, Cécile, pour tes mots trop gentils, trop aimables. Thank you very much, Cécile, for your two kind words. But it's my honor to uh, be the first, I um, understand, um, um, speaker in, I, I suppose, what's going to be a series of talks year after year in honor of our colleague, former colleague, friend, uh, Michel Say. Um, so I, I want to thank you very much, you personally, but I want also to thank Laura, Laura Whitman, um, Andrea Brown, who did a wonderful job organizing this, uh, this meeting, the DLCL in general, the French and Italian department, and all the friends of Michel Say who are with us tonight, and my own friends whom I don't see, but I feel their presence. So I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation given as the, uh, the, the circumstances, it might be the easiest way to, uh, for all most comfortable to um, exchange ideas. So I'm going to share my screen, hoping it's going to work. Yeah, you tell me if it doesn't. Okay, I hope it works, yeah. So you will understand the meaning, well, some of you, I'm sure, especially the French here, or the, uh, those who are a culture to French culture on the, the um, origin of this title, on the eternal silence of these infinite spaces. I have five parts. The first one is Michel Say, mathematician, philosopher, and poet. Michel Say was at once a mathematician, a philosopher, and a poet. That is why I call him the Pascal, Blaise Pascal of the 20th century. The names of other leg legendary, sorry, I'm a pro taking a problem here, of other legendary uh, polymaths spring to mind. For instance, Auguste Dupin, um, the character, uh, the fictional detective created by Edgar Allan Poe, was a mathematician and a poet. Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian poet and super writer, um, was um, the master of the short story, was a poet and a, and a metaphysician. Uh, if we go back to the 17th century, the century of the absolute monarchy, which the French called the Grand Siècle, there was no shortage of intellectual figures who were at once mathematicians and philosophers. In that illustrious company, the name of Descartes, of course, comes to mind and stands out, but only, only, bless Pascal, another great mind of the 17th century combined all three of these dimensions of the human, human genius in his writing. Three centuries later, we have Michel. To pay him tribute, as I, have, as I have the honor and the pleasure of doing today, does not necessarily mean repeating what he said or miming what he did. A thinker's work is most vital and alive when, when it inspires us to take it up in our turn, to question it, to let it germinate in us so that we may invent something new. That is what I will try to do today before this. Michel Say was a fertile and prolific writer throughout his long career. I have chosen to talk about his very first book, his doctoral dissertation published in Paris in 1968 under the title Leibniz System and its Mathematical Models. This is Michel Serre on the right. Huh? Um, Michel Serre, I think, was like Cary Grant 
as he grew as he grew older, he was more and more handsome. Um, this difficult and relatively little known work exemplifies Serre's thinking at its most brilliant and most profound. All of Michel Serre, the mathematician, the philosopher, and the poet, is already fully present in its pages. Our time is limited and I must make painful choices. I'm going to concentrate on the third and last part of the book, which is devoted to the structure of what mathematicians call a fixed point. T.S. Eliot had a striking phrase for the same idea. In his magnificent poem, Burnt Norton, Eliot spoke of, quote, the steel point of the turning world. Some kind of fixed point, of steel point around which the whole system revolves, appears in every great field of thought, from logic, metaphysics, and cosmology, to literature, economics, and political philosophy. Before going any further, I'd like to cite an interesting data. In a sample of the population surveyed by the National Science Foundation, more than half of Americans did not know how to answer or could not understand the following question. How much time does it take for the earth to turn around the sun? Not unsurprisingly, those who were unable to answer this question proved quite ready to affirm their belief in astrology or flying saucers. I don't want to be, need, to be mean, the US, uh, America. Um, I'm not sure that in France, my country, things would be very different. Um, uh, France, Cartesian country, the country of Descartes. But do you know that Descartes never really endorsed the so-called heliocentric uh, theory that the earth uh, revolves around this, the sun. That's what we're going to see now. Second part, the vanity of the heliocentric controversy. Let's return to the 17th and early 18th century and those three indisputable geniuses, Descartes, Pascal and Leibniz. Descartes published his metaphysical med meditations in 1641. Pascal pub published his provincial letters in 1657, while also creating with Fermat the calculus of probabilities, which he called the geometry of chance. And in 1710, the German philosoph philosopher Leibniz published in French his essays on theodicy, in which he meant to resolve the problem of evil while also inventing by the same token in competition with Newton, infinitesimal calculus. Well, as it happens, not one of these three towering 17th century thinkers embraced the notion that the earth turns around the sun. Yet this idea, known as heliocentrism had been established a century earlier in, 15, um, in 1530 by the Polish astronomer Nicolaus Copernicus and had been given the form of three mathematical laws by the German astronomer Johannes Kepler between 1609 and 1618. And it was these laws which led Isaac Newton to establish the theory of gravity in 1687. Michel Serre begins his Pascalian meditation by setting himself the, the, the aim of illuminating this immense paradox. Descartes, in his 1644 work, The Principles of Philosophy, de defends the doctrine that the earth does not move. Pascal, in the famous fragment on the two infinities, speaks of the sun's vast circular trajectory around the earth and deems it best not to discuss what he terms the opinion of Copernicus. As for Leibniz, he seeks to preserve the two opposite ways of saying things, the, the geocentrism of Ptolemy 
and the heliocentrism of Copernicus. Traditionally, this anachronistic survival of geocentrism has been explained, because it was noticed before Michel Serre, of course, has been explained by the impact that two notorious events had on every educated mind of that era, namely the 1633 trial of Galileo and the ordeal, the ordeal of the Dominican friar Giordano Bruno stripped naked and burned alive in Rome's Campo dei Fiori on February 17th, 1600. Not only had Bruno refined Copernicus, Copernicus's heliocentric theory, he had also postulated that the universe is infinite. That was much more than the church would accept. However, and that's here that we see his full genius. Michel Serre proposes another much more intriguing and thought provoking interpretation of what appears to be an inconceivable step backwards in human knowledge. Descartes, Pascal, and Leibniz were preoccupied with a question more basic. Sorry. Yeah, more basic than identifying the center of the universe. Before asking whether the center was the earth or the sun, our three philosopher mathematicians faced a dizzying preliminary question. Does the universe even have a center? Such a hypothetical center was commonly known as a fixed point. Prior to any Copernican revolution, the problem was to know to know whether a fixed point is possible and if, in fact, it exists. The history I'm recounting begins with cosmology, but it is obvious that cosmology is simply an entryway into a much broader quest. The search for something that would serve as a privileged vantage point, a center of gravity or fulcrum, an origin or reference point for human reason, history, action, and salvation. Whether their goal was mastering the world around us, Descartes, determining the place of our destiny, Pascal, or achieving universal knowledge, Leibniz, the great philosophers of the classical age all posed the question of the existence of what Eliot called the still point of the turning world. Turning world. And here I want to render homage to this great, great poet, T.S. Eliot. Uh, time, and the quote is very interesting in itself for what I have to say. Time past and time future, what might have been and what has been, point to one end, which is always present. The main obstacle facing the mathematicians and philosophers of the period was the concept of infinity. Any solid object has a center of gravity around which the play of forces is ordered. But an infinitely large object would have no identifiable center of gravity. Cosmologists can be divided into two camps. On one side stand those who, like Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Kepler, believe that the world is finite and has a center. On the other side are those who, like Giordano Bruno, Pascal, and Leibniz, hold the universe to be infinite. For the partisans of an infinite universe, the fixed point represents not only a form formidable theoretical problem, but also a source of metaphysical anguish. Michel Serre quotes Kepler, who rejected the hypothesis of an infinite universe in part because of the dread that it inspired in him. That thought carries with it some secret horror. One finds oneself adrift in a vastness devoid of any boundaries, any center, and for that reason, any defined location. It's not good for a voyager to go astray in that infiniteness. Serre, Serre, Michel Serre comments. Here we see expressed before, Pas before Pascal's pensée, 
the metaphysical terror a human being feels at the prospect of a wide open world without limits in time or space, a world lacking both center and meaning, where one's only fate is to wander aimlessly. Please keep in mind this phrase, well, where one's only fate is to wander aimlessly. We're going to find it again soon. And uh, to become that voyager gone astray who has forever lost his way home. Those of you who have seen Alfonso Cuaron's film Gravity know well, know how well Hollywood managed to co convey this, this anguish of a voyager cut adrift in infinite space. If the universe is infinite, it's like a sphere where the center is everywhere and the circumference nowhere. This phrase, which immediately calls to mind Pascal, I've forgotten to, I forgot. Um, okay. If the universe is infinite, it's like a sphere where the center is everywhere and the circumference nowhere. This phrase, which immediately calls to mind Pascal, but also Leibniz, can already actually be found in Giordano Bruno. This is what he wrote or said. An infinite sphere, a sphere has no true center. Um, 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 it is everywhere a center. And moreover, it has no periphery. Michel Serre comments. My appearance in the middle is characterized by the homogeneous nature of the centered space. Rather than simply lacking a center, the depolarized space is infinitely saturated with centers. Rather than possessing a privileged reference point, it is isotropic, meaning that it displays the same physical properties in all directions. In this isotrop isotropic and homogeneous analytic space, my state is everywhere the same, the same. My natural place is everywhere and nowhere. And so the sum total of my knowledge, my vision, my conduct, and my destiny is distributed in an arbitrary and a haphazard manner. I am at home everywhere, which is to say I'm at home nowhere. In this space where no point is any more singular than any other, it matters little whether the earth turns around the sun or the sun around the earth. The controversy over heliocentrism loses all meaning. But this world bereft of any fixed point may well inspire fear in those who contemplate it. As Pascal confesses in an immortal phrase that every French person, I think, knows by heart, but I'm going to say it in English. The eternal silence of these infinite spaces frightens me. The silence eternal de ces espaces infinis m'effraie. The image here is, uh, is uh, from the Quaron's uh, uh, movie. Huh? Uh, uh, that's uh, an incredible figure. I mean, that's expressed very well. The, um, you know, Hollywood is not always uh, stupid. Huh? Um, this eternal silence of these infinite spaces. Next chapter, not a fixed point, not the absence of one, the endogenous fixed point as included middle. Pascal, Pascal's quest for a fixed point was thwarted, I think you have, under, I hope you have understood that, not by a lack of what he sought, but by overabundance. We navigate a desacralized space in which each point is equally a fixed point, and for that, for that very reason, none is. But that is only true of this world from which God has taken leave. Pascal elaborated his pagan cosmology in order to establish that the fixed point we all seek does indeed exist, but in a world other than our own. This Deus absconditus, this hidden therefore, hidden God, sorry, is hidden only because human reason is incapable of apprehending it. Leibniz had a different take on these questions. 
as an absolute rationalist and an unrepentant optimist, Leibniz wanted to inject some mathematical order into this Christian pessimism. And he did so by first tackling the problem that the existence of evil represent for human reason. That is the subject of the class that I'm currently teaching at Stanford, at Stanford in quotes, of course. However, rather than continuing to follow Michel Serre's line of argument here, I'm now going to present some of my own research on the fixed point that owes a great deal to Serre's style of thinking. I'll return to, 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 to Michel uh, later. Serre extolled what he liked to call the included middle, as opposed to the excluded middle term of conventional yes or no logic. My argument would be faithful to Michel Serre in as much as it consists in introducing a third term between the presence of a fixed point and the absence of a fixed point in the world of humans. This third term or included middle as Michel Serre calls it, is what I call an endogenous fixed point. I hope it will be clear, become clear in a moment. To introduce this concept, I'm going to do a little mathematics, very little, and I'm sure everyone can understand that. I will take as my starting point one of Pascal's physical mathematical constructions that Michel Serres analyzed, the theory of a scale with infinite long arms. Before Pascal, Aristotle and Archimedes had already done much to elucidate this concept, but not enough. And Pascal uh, finished the job. Imagine that one were to place masses of both sides of a bar of potentially infinite length. The arms of scale must balance around the fulcrum the red triangle that you see here. Here is an example in front of your eyes, I hope. So I introduced a notion here that uh, Pascal was able to uh, define and analyze the momentum or a moment or, or of a force. It, so there, you had three, number, uh, three numbers here below the bar, one, five, two. These are the weights or rather the masses. These are the masses. And you have six, two, and eight, which are the distances um, of these masses from the fulcrum. Oh. So each mass contributes to the scale's imbal imbalance in proportion to its moment or momentum. Again, a mass's moment is the product of its weight multiplied by its distance from the fulcrum. The scale uh, Pascal demonstrated is in balance when the sum of the moments on one side of scale is equal to the sum of the moments on the other side. In this example, the two, mass, the two masses on the left side have been placed at distances of six and two units from the fulcrum and the mass on the right side is at a distance of eight. You multiply the distance of each mass, mass by its weight, that gives you on the left hand side, six multiplied by one plus two multiplied by five, that's six plus 10, that's 16. And if you multiply now the mass two by eight, you, uh, you get 16. And you verify that the balance is in equilibrium. Now, here is a question for you. Is the fulcrum of the scale its fixed point? The answer is no. Right now, both sides balance around the fulcrum. What, what will happen if we change the weights and the distances of the masses on either side? The only way to keep the scale in balance will be to move the fulcrum. So it is not the fulcrum that determines the balance between the weights. It is on the, it is on the contrary, the weights that determine the necessary position of the fulcrum. So the fulcrum cannot be said to be the fixed point of the system. Let us now leave Pascal's era and fast forward two and a half centuries. I'm going to read to you a passage from Emile Durkheim's last great book, The Elementary Forms of the Religious Life, published in 1912. 
Durkheim is, descri is, sorry, Durkheim is, descri is describing an orator speaking to a crowd. His language has a sort of grandilo grandiloquence that would be ridiculous in ordinary circumstances. There is something dominating about his gestures. His very thinking is impatient of proportion and easily, easily allows itself to go to every sort of extreme. That is because he feels as if he were overflowing with a normal plethora of forces that tend to spread out from him. Sometimes he even has the impression that he's dominated by a moral power that transcends him and of which he is but the interpreter. Now, this exceptional surplus of forces is quite real. It comes from the very group that he's addressing. The feelings that his words arouse come back to him but swollen, amplified, and they reinforce his own feeling to the same degree. It's an extraordinary quote. The, so, but let's analyze it. There is a huge paradox uh, at, the mirror, at, the, at the center. The, on the one hand, the orator dominates the crowd, but where does he get the energy to do that? From the crowd itself. So he dominates the crowd thanks to the crowd. The force that dominates him, a power that transcends him, emanates, emanates from the crowd. Every, everything takes place as if the crowd exteriorized itself in the person of the orator. Various terms exist in philosophical parlance to describe this type of phenomenon. Hegel uses the word enticeable, that is self-exteriorization, self if you like. Um, Friedrich Hayek speaks of self-transcendence. In contemporary American English, it is sometimes uh, uh, called bootstrap, a reference to the, um, to the tale. Um, it's, a, it's a novel written by um, a German um, um, a thinker in the um, 18th century, uh, Hopp, if I, I'm not mistaken, the, the, the adventures of Baron Münchhausen, um, who, uh, when his, his horse sank in a swamp, was able to rise out of the mire by putting on the laces of his boots. In the original story, is putting on his own ponytail, as it's represented here. So you have all these words, bootstrap, self-transcendence, self-exterrorization, and toysel, and fremdung, and also, that's the ordinary translation, both of Enteusserung and Entfremdung, alienation in Marx. As described by Burka, the orator, the orator addressing a crowd displays all the features of a fixed point, except for the most important one. He is not actually the organizing center, like the fulcrum in Pascal's infinite scale. He is created by the very thing that he appears to be organizing. Although it looks like the orator is controlling the crowd, the energy that animates him comes from the crowd itself. What, here, what we have here is not a true fixed point, but neither is it the anguish inspiring absence of any fixed point. It is a, it's neither nor, it is a fixed point generated from within the system's own dynamic. It's what I call an endogenous fixed point that is created, created from within. In my work, I've shown over many, many years, I've shown that this concept can shed light on many open questions in moral and political philosophy, in metaphysics, in economics, and the social sciences, such as power in Hobbes, the general will in Rousseau, wealth in Adam Smith, the commodity in Marx, social justice in John Rawls, to cite just a few examples. Now, I would like to present the second part of my talk, uh, paragraphs four and five. I would like to present two case studies of paradoxical fixed points. First, power and panic in Freud's study of crowd behavior. And second, the future of the human race, our future, as we face the looming disasters that threaten us. I've not chosen these two examples uh, at random, of course, because these are two kinds of problems that 
that we have to deal with. So chapter four, power and panic in Freud viewed, viewed as endogenous fixed. I will now examine the theory of crowds and panic that Freud proposes in his book, Massenpsychologie und ich, uh, uh, I, th I thought it was analysis, but okay. Um, um, translated into English as group psychology and the analysis of the ego. Freud, Freud begins with the theory that is constructivist or structuralist avant la lettre. In his own words, the phenomenon of panic seems to be a paradox. I will try to show you that the paradox dissolves once we introduce the concept of endogenous fixed point. What holds a crowd together? For Freud, the answer can only be eros, quote, which holds together everything in the world. Eros, that is love. In other words, a crowd is held together by libidinal bonds. The contagious behavior is so characteristic of crowds, it's transmitted through these libidinal bonds. They are the pathways of contagion. But the focal point of these bonds is the leader. Each member of the crowd takes a leader as an external libidinal, libidinal object. Freud does recognize the existence of leaderless crowds, spontaneous and ephemeral gatherings, but the real models for his theory of the crowd are the army and the church. These, as he calls them, artificial crowds are constructed by and around their leader. In other words, the leader is a new example of a fixed point. Everyone identifies with everyone else thanks to their shared effective bond with the leader. The members of the crowd put the leader ahead of themselves. They all abandon their self-love in favor of love for the leader. In this diagram, the fulcrum, you see, where all the arrows converge, is a leader, the place where you know. The leader, you see, there is a self-referential self-referential loops starting from the leader and returning to the leader. That is self-love. And all the other arrows are the libidinal ties that lead the members, that link the members of the crowd to the leader. So one can say that in the scheme, everyone loves the leader. The, the non-leaders love the leader, and the leader loves himself. The only one in this configuration who does not abandon his self-love is the leader. That's an incredible paradox, huh? but as Freud's theory, it has to be deconstructed. According to Freud, the leader loves only himself and has no need for anyone else. This very autonomy is what singles him out and guarantees his power. Paradoxically, the founding block of the social order embodied in the crowd is an apparently anti-social individual, the leader. At the center of the crowd is the one person who represents an exception to its organizing principle. The case in point, but I don't want to insist, is this one. Okay. <clears throat> Here we rediscover the paradox of the center structure that, for those of you who are familiar with his thought, that Jacques Derrida famously brought out. In classical thought, Derrida says, quote, the center is paradoxically within the structure and outside it. The center is at the center of the totality, and yet, since the center does not belong to the totality, the totality has its center elsewhere. The center is not the center. The concept of centered structure is contradictorily coherent. I know many people, especially in the philosophy department at Stanford, who consider that this is, uh, what's the word? Um, Gallic, uh, what, is, what is it? I forgot the uh, very insulting phrase. Um, Okay, I forgot, all the better. Um, now, 
What happens when the center structure loses its center altogether? What happens when a crowd loses its fixed point, the leader? This is what we observe in the phenomenon of panic, Freud tells us. In a sense, panic represents the fulfillment of what deconstruction sets out to achieve, that is, deprive, to deprive a centered structure of its center. Freud's answer to our question is unequivocal. Quote, it is impossible to doubt that panic means the disintegration of crowd and brings with it the cessation of all attachment among its members. Once the effective bonds with the leader are broken, the crowd should lose all cohesion and we have panic. Yet Freud admits that the crowd, if I ask you to think of a crowd um, and close your eyes and think of a crowd, you won't think of the army or the church. You certainly uh, think of, I don't know, the, the, the masses in the streets of uh, New York City uh, in 1929, 1930, etc. Panics, you would think of panics. Uh, yet Freud admits, and he, that's what he says, at, uh, in panic, the collective mind does away with itself at the very moment at which it manifests its most characteristic properties. Yeah. The crowd looks most like a crowd when, um, um, okay, the, the, I won't repeat that. And Freud notes the, this paradox, the paradoxical nature of his observation, but makes nothing of it. Let me try to resolve these various paradoxes using the concept of endogenous fixed point. First, we must realize that the leader is not the independent external fixed point he appears to be. He does not attain his central position because of any intrinsic features such as his supposed self-sufficiency or autonomy. The leader may give the, imp the, the impression that is self-sufficient, self that is self, etc. that he doesn't need the affection of others, but that is only an illusion. We believe he could do, he could do without this affection, uh, affection, but only because he has already acquired it. Should he lose it, he will be willing to go to great lengths to regain his former status. It is the crowd's love for the leader that singles him out and guarantees his power. In this sense, the leader is a creation of the crowd. He is an endogenous fixed point. There is a circular relationship between the crowd, the crowd and the leader. Together, they form a system that look, looks, look, sorry, loops back on itself, which I represent in this way. So we have the initial schema but I've added two huge blue arrows here. They mean that if the, um, the leader gives the impression that he loves himself, it's just because he imitates the love that the others have for him and vice versa. Uh, the others love the leaders because they imitate the love that the leader has for himself. This is the essence of an endogenous fixed point. Now, what happens when the crowd loses its leader? Well, my thesis is that there is simply the substitution of one endogenous fixed point for another. Elias Canetti, or Elias Canetti, in his classic book, Crowds and Power, says, quote, that a crowd needs a direction, a goal given from outside sorry, a goal given from outside each individual that is, quote, identical for all. When a crowd of panicked individuals all flee in the same direction, everyone imitates the overall movement. Although the leader is gone, another fixed point, endogenous fixed point, of course, has taken his place, a new endogenous fixed point, produced by the members of the crowd. Um, this new fixed point is none other than the movement of the crowd itself. This time, there is a circular relationship. 
between the action of the individuals who make up the crowd and the crowd as a whole. Left to its own devices with no leader to guide it, the crowd still forms a system that loops back on itself. And we have exactly the same uh, schema. Um, here the fulcrum, if you like, the endogenous fixed point, it was a leader, now it's a movement of the panic. It's very clear in the case of linear panics, eh, when everyone um, runs away in the same direction. Okay, I'm, I'm now on, um, um, arrived at my five and last. Uh, Laura, could you tell me how much time I've, uh, I've spent so much so far? Keith, then you can wrap up in, in three, five minutes. So we have time for questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, three, five minutes. Yeah, I have only two pages, but they are, yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's a, uh, by the way, I have a long version, right, because as you, as, as you may see, I'm reading uh, aloud a paper, uh, and I have a long version and short version. In the long version, this topic, which is essential because it's about the catastrophes that uh, threaten the survival of uh, human climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, nuclear weapons, nuclear war. Um, and I have a short version. I'm going to read out the short version, two pages only. Huh? But those who want to read the long version, I'll be happy to send them to, to them. Just uh, send an email to them. Okay, so um, in the face of looming disasters, dealing with the future, that's obvious, becomes an essential task. It is also one fought with paradox, as Voltaire shows in his tale, Zadig, the Zadig paradox. Um, so uh, Voltaire, uh, uh, wrote three philosophical tales in order to criticize and make fun of Leibniz's uh, theories. Uh, you know, of course, everyone knows uh, one of them, Candide, there is Micromegas, and there is Zadig, which might be the more, most interesting. The hero of the story, Zadig, is traveling with a mysterious hermit. The lady graciously offers them a place to stay for the night. The next, next day after leaving her house, the hermit kills the lady's nephew. Zadig is appalled. Why would you commit such a terrible crime, he asks. Is that any way to reward our benefactor for her generosity? But the hermit, who is none other than the angel Jezrad, the spokesperson of the Leibnizian system, tells Zadig, if that young man had lived, he would have murdered his aunt a year from now, and the next year he would have murdered you, Zadig. Zadig is flabbergasted. How do you know that, he asks. The angel, the angel answers, it was written. Well, it may have been written, but now the prophesied murders will never occur. Voltaire's uh, tale inspired, inspired the great American science fiction um, author, Philip K. Dick, to write a complex and subtle story called The Minority Report. That all of you, I suppose, know, uh, even if it's via the uh, not very good film that Spielberg made. If there is a paradox here, it is only in so far as the future is conceived as an exogenous fixed point. For the prophet to be a good prophet, in the sense that his prophecy succeeds in stopping an imminent catastrophe, he must also be a false prophet because he must foretell a future disaster that does not come to pass and that doesn't come to pass because of his prophecy. Um, the alternative methods that have proposed under the name enlightened doomsday consists in taking the catastrophic future as an endogenous fixed point. The individual actors determine their present actions as a function of this future, which they treat in their reasoning 
as if it were fixed, even though they know that it is in fact determined by their present actions. Here we find the same kind of circular relationship between the members of the collectivity and their fixed point that we just saw in the case of the crowd that takes its own overall movement as fixed point. When we take our own future as fixed point to determine our present actions, we and the future form a system that loops, loops back on itself. So my last word is, um, you know, Michel was very fond of etymologies. Was, and some of his etymologies were so incredible that many people suspected that he made them up. So this is one of the best, I suppose, and it's very much in tune with what I've said, said so far. Okay. Um, so we start from um, the Latin verb errare, which meant being wrong. But there was another Latin word, iterare, which meant to travel, iter, path. Yeah? But you see, iterare, errare, yeah, it, it contains errare. Those two verbs were merged into one. So, yeah. Errare. And normally, the meaning of errare should have been to take the wrong road. No, you combine being wrong and to travel, you take the wrong road. That's not at all what happened. That's not at all what happened. What happened is this. There is a verb in French, modern French, errer, which means not to take the wrong road, but to go wandering without a predetermined destination. Remember the wandering in the infinite space? I was talking about before, that's a link between the two case studies. Okay, but it's not the end of, the, uh, of this incredible etymology. Uh, so one could say that, um, um, so you wander, but when you reach the end of your wandering, you look back at the road taken and you tell yourself that you were destined to arrive in the place where you find now yourself, as if it constituted a, a, a goal, an exogenous fixed point. In reality, of course, it is chance that led you there. And as the great Spanish poet Antonio Machado said, caminando no hay camino, se hace camino al andar. Wanderer, it's less good in English. Huh? Wanderer, there is no road, road walking makes the road. That is the very definition of endogenous fixed point. So perfectly does it imitate an exogenous one that chance has retrospectively, retrospectively turned into necessity. In modern French, that's not the end, but then now comes the end. Modern French, there is a word, errance, that means exactly wandering. But there is a synonym, a synonym for errance, which is randonnée. And randonnée is, that's the last word, the source, of course, of the English word random. The loop is loop back. So, quod erat demonstrandum. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jean Pierre. Um, I think it was a perfect illustration of the way your mind works and how <laughs> you, uh, like how you make us think further with concepts that can be applied to so many important um, issues. You know, it, because I could see the endogenous fixed point applied to the law, to yeah. the current pandemic, um, to um, you know, so you start from physics and metaphysics, and then this tool that you provide us with can be helpful in so many other fields. So we're going to, um, uh, I'm going to, to read you some uh, questions, if any. First, there are some comments uh, from colleagues. So I'll share that quickly. Dan, uh, congratulates you on your talk, as well as Sophie Bancard. And um, please write your Q&A, um, uh, your question in the Q&A box. Um, we're waiting for a few questions. So I'll start with one um, because I, I could not help thinking about it. 
this idea that we transform into destiny what was um, not written from the start, but in the making yeah. of the road. Um, it reminded me of the conundrum in uh, applying uh, sanitary measures during the pandemic and uh, listening to epidemiologists who said, if we go this direction and do not apply certain measures, then we'll have this kind of exponential rise in cases and deaths. But of course, if we take those measures, it won't happen. And then people say, see, it didn't happen. So why, you know, you were wrong. So could yeah. you, you know, unpack this um, oh. for us? My God, how much time do you give me? Two, two more hours? <laughs> no, because it's, <laughs> um, I've, I've actually, I've written the whole book to, uh, that you mentioned, uh, precisely to answer this kind of, uh, this kind of question. Yeah. Um, so it all dates, my, my starting point was Dexon's remark that um, a major catastrophe that occurred in August 1914, the fourth of us was the declaration of war uh, to France by Germany. And Bergson explains that for him and his friends before the declaration of war, um, they thought of this event and they took it to be at the same time um, almost certain and impossible. Okay, that's a paradox, of course. That's another paradox. Uh, but then in another text, the, the possible and real, the possible and real. He, when he speaks of the work of art, he says that before, uh, let's say, Picasso painted in 1907, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, this painting was impossible because the artist creates the possible when he creates, he creates the real, the real work of art. And then we can come back to the first remark. Um, the possible doesn't pre-exist the real. If the possible doesn't pre-exist the real, uh, of course, we won't, we won't uh, act. Huh? Uh, it's possible that the um, nuclear war um, be the case uh, be, before the end of, uh, let's say, uh, before the end of the, uh, of the decade or, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's possible. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, no, it's certain, but as soon as it, sorry, as long as it has not happened, it remains in the world of impossibility. It's impossible. But now, if we manage to um, spend a lot of money to cure this pandemic, a lot of money, we uh, sacrifice the economy, we sacrifice the fundamental liberties, the epidemic is um, over. Then th there will be inevitably many people will say, but why all these sacrifices? They are already saying, well, all these sacrifices for nothing, look, nothing happened. Huh? So it's because as long, if the epidemic doesn't happen, I mean, it has happened, no. Let me take the example of nuclear war. If the, uh, thanks to all the measures we take, the nuclear war doesn't occur, then it remains in the field of the impossible. Huh? So why, why do all this? I mean, you see. So as soon as the catastrophe occurs, all the preventive, preventative measures prove superfluous, so useless. It's, um, so it's this paradox that corresponds to a certain conception of time, huh? which is a Bergsonian conception of time, and it has its validity. It's a form of metaphysics of temporality, and it explains, you know, I'm, I'm kind because you could say those deniers, COVID deniers are just stupid. I'm not trying to do that. I'm saying there must be a reason behind it and try to find it. What's the implicit metaphysics of temporality that we have in mind? Okay. Uh, Jean-Pierre, okay. I'm wondering if um, there is a different temporality that helps us with that paradox. I, I know that uh, the endogenous fixed point is a, is a different way to think about it, 
I'm wondering what I'm asking about is, is there a concept of time that is connected to the endogenous fixed point? But that, that, that was my last um, section, of course, it, it was reduced to almost nothing <laughs> because of con time constraint. I'm sorry, I certainly- no, A little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but so if you give me the time I would have taken to there, there read the longer version, I would, yeah. But it's precisely um, to take the future, <clears throat> um, well, you know, it's almost impossible to say it in three words, but uh, uh, my solution, my enlightened doomsday is to do as if there was a fatality, it will happen. The catastrophe will occur. The nuclear war will occur, mm -hmm. but it may not occur. Actually, a poet said that very well. Borges, which I cited, cited at the beginning. In one of his texts, he said, el porvenir es inevitable, pero puede no acontecer. Mm -hmm. The future is inevitable, but it may not occur. Uh, so of course, it's not a rational solution to that paradox, mm -hmm. but I think we can make this, uh, the, the, my solution is to um, have, uh, consider a future that is at the same time necessary and things that happen in the future happen necessarily mm -hmm. but this necessity in a sense i was responding i was saying that when i responded to um, to Ceci, this necessity is only retrospective huh? only retrospective mm -hmm. it's once once it happens it becomes true that it was necessary from old from time immemorial but not before it happens. Um, and you know, this metaphysic is not the, uh, metaphysics is not the creation of a, a sick uh, philosopher in his ivory tower. Um, it's the, you know, I come from a um, uh, highly agricultural, agricultural region, the Southwest of France, but I'm in a rural area and people reason exactly like that. Uh, and many rural areas in the world, I suppose people reason, reason like that. That is, if a, a major catastrophe uh, occurs, that is the loss of a, let's say, only son. Uh, people say it was written, it was written. Um, it had to happen. But before it happens, they don't think it's necessary at all. So necessity becomes, I mean, necessity becomes to be the case once the event has occurred. Before, the future is still open, but once the future has chosen, then looking back, everything uh, is as if the, ne the necessary character of this catastrophe had always, always been the case. Okay, that's, uh, that's something that also Günther Anders, whom Cecil mentioned at the beginning, uh, thought out also very well. Uh, um, okay, so it's, it's a complicated um, uh, 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 philosophy of metaphysics of the future, but again, it's accessible to everyone because that's how many rural populations reason. Uh, retrospective necessity. So it's not a fatalism, it's not a fatalism. We have a because it may, it may, it may not occur. Um, we have a question that goes back to uh, the beginning of the talk, and I'll read it. The medieval text, the book of the 24 philosophers, contains the quote, God is an infinite sphere, the center of which is everywhere, their circumference nowhere. Modern astrophysics would for the most part confirm this statement with the exceptions of describing the cosmos as God oh. and a sphere. In other words, neither religion nor Euclidean geometry conforms with current understanding of the universe. Do you think Serre would agree with this? Neither religion. Um, hola. <laughs> hola, I have to think about it. Uh, <laughs> Oh, the, the only thing I can, well, I, I'm not sure it's related huh, to the uh, anonymous attendee, uh, but Sarah 
writes the following in the book I've commented upon. Uh, um, people who thought at the time, 17th century, um, for instance, Kepler, etc. Kepler was afraid of um, imagining an infinite space, an infinite universe. Um, these people prepared the 19th century. But those who, like Pascal, Leibniz, Giordano Bruno before, um, had the courage to think of an infinite universe, prepared the 20th century, thinking of, of course, Einstein's general relativity. Yeah, um, um, yeah that's a, but I'm not sure it's related to, like, I would have to think hard. So there is a medieval text, a uh, uh, text, we, um, do you, but it, problems I cannot enter into a dialogue with this person. Um, the, the center of which is every. So maybe you have a different question for you. Um, to save you from this one. Yeah. Yes. So going back to the, the first um, Q and A answers. Um, so is it, because of this psychology of time that examples from the past historical events have more power to prevent their own repetition than warning. For instance, in Europe, the effect of World War II and the Holocaust has been long lasting in uh, setting up public opinion in favor of the European Union and against participating in wars uh, and up to this day, um, the shadow of World War II and the Holocaust is very, very long. However, um, the European Union itself is, is very much incapable of facing um, almost predictable future catastrophes, uh, such as global warming, um, impending on us, and uh, the rise of populism. So to, to summarize, do you think that only the past help us see the future as it might come and prevent the future from happening as it would if it had not been already evidence in the past? Or is that too complicated? Well, yeah, it's, uh, again, these are so, this, this is your question, Cecile? It's your question? Yeah, it's my question. Oh, it's, it's, it's your question. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm we'll just talking that only when we have an example of the past, people kind of yeah. actually yeah, yeah. take measures. But if we say, you know, this is coming up, no, no, it's not come up yet. So we don't see it doing yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, here, you know, the most brilliant student of Bexon's was Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre. And it's interesting to compare as I, well, I've, I've tried to do it, to compare the, uh, confront the, uh, their respective metaphysics. But okay, but Sartre um, thought that only the future gives meaning to the past. So, okay, that's, what, that's why it would be so, um, so awful to have no future. Huh? Uh, no future would mean, and that's also, that's also a thought that Günther Anders had. Um, um, if the future were stopped, and that's uh, Laura, that's in the Divine Comedy, huh? if the future were stopped at one point, so, then, we would lose the beyond future, of course, but we would lose the past as well, because the future completes the past instead. The past has no fixed meaning until the future occurs. Huh? All these notions are connected to one another. Huh? And so in, in the terms of, um, okay, my, 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 my favorite metaphysics is a loop between the future and the past. The future gives meaning to the past and the past determines the future. And we have to think out this loop. Um, uh, an economist would say expectations, uh, uh, anticipation in French. Expectations matter most, they determine. Expectations is a relation to the future. Uh, and uh, for, for instance, economic crisis, the Keynesian, uh, interpretation are, are uh, due to uh, expectations that are 
self-fulfilling in a sense. Huh? Expectation can be self-fulfilling. So the past is one determinism, but, but the future itself, the image of the future that we have, retroacts feedbacks into the, the past, and it's the loop that you have to uh, take. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the origin of this loop, it's not the past, it's the future. The future as endogenous fixed point, uh, as a solution to this circle. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's hard to explain these things in uh, just uh, two or three sentences, but these are fundamental questions, of course. These are the questions. Well, thank you so much. Uh, there are no, no more questions, I think, in the Q&A, but a lot of requests to uh, receive the long version. So we'll ask you for it and we'll distribute. Yeah, thank yeah. You, but thank you for this really un, you know, wonderful talk. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was reading uh, the, um, some of the uh, questions. Uh, I'm sorry that there is no time to answer them, my fault. I have a list of people who want to receive the long version, so they will be able to, we will send it to all of you who are out there who requested it. And well, uh, you know what, uh, it would be simple if I send it to you. Yes. And, and all, the re the, all the requests would be sent to you then, no? Yes, that sounds great. You can send the request to me, actually, I don't know if I can, uh, you can find me at Stanford. Um, it's L, L. Whitman. So just my name as it is on the screen with an L before it uh, at stanford.edu. So if you didn't ask already, uh, you can send me an email um, and we will send you the longer version. Absolutely. I will take care yeah. of it. <laughs> so much, Jean. Yeah, you know what, what, what I can send also because they, they are complimentary. Huh? It's the PDF of the PPT, the PDF of the PPT. Oh, that is yeah. the PDF, the PDF format of the project of the slides of the uh, PowerPoint that I huh? so because the slides add to the text. Mm -hmm. so. so I've collected all the emails that were sent in the Q&A and we'll see if we can just send to the entire group who um, registered uh, the documents and the link to the video since we recorded the video. Uh, but otherwise, you can please send an email, but you should expect some communication about this soon.